In addition to the trailer and store pages we've already looked at, there's still more Frank Stone info to pour over. So let's do that. Starting with the website. The animated picture of Frank is nice, with the dust motes in the air and flashing red lights adding a nice touch to the overall vibe. I honestly find the mask a little puzzling, because it's supposed to look like he's just reshaped a welder's mask. But the two tusks have way more metal than they should if that was the case. If you folded them over, they'd overlap, which doesn't really make sense. Maybe they could have been welded on instead? Now, about the whole cannibal thing. It's interesting that there's blood all over Frank's mouth, but almost none on his mask. More interesting, though, are the bloody streaks running down his neck. Is this a failed attempt by Frank to wipe blood off his face, or are we seeing the aftermath of Frank biting off someone's fingers and then their hand limply falling down his face and chest? I wish I didn't have to say that the second is more likely, but it probably is. Also, I love the knobs on the side of his head. They're practical, of course, but plenty of people have already observed how the Frank Stone name can be seen as very similar to Frankenstein, and the knobs definitely offer a visual callback to the classic design's neck bolts. The text describing the game is intriguing. I'm sure they hoped it would be, of course, especially the idea of crimes spawning horrors beyond comprehension. Does this line suggest that the glimpses we see of the entity in the game are its first forays into this world? Given the breadth of characters that are pulled into its realm, it's been well established that the entity exists outside of time, so in a sense, concepts like first become meaningless. But nevertheless, is the implication here that Frank was tormented by visions of the entity, as suggested by his notebook, and that he committed his crimes to summon it to our world, and that the events of this game end up inspiring the form that the entity's trials take? We've already seen a classic Dead by Daylight generator in the Cedar Steel Mill. This is the exact model, save for a lack of floodlights on top of it. But is this just the tip of the iceberg? There are design elements that the entity keeps consistent no matter what is setting it's recreating. The generators, hatches, lockers, and the fuses by the escape doors all seem to look the same, which raises the question, why is that appearance important to the entity? Is it because all of those things were present when it first came in contact with our world, or at least this version of our world? And it's been recreating Frank's experiences ever since? We've seen the Dead by Daylight generator in a dozen different locations. It always looks pointedly out of place in cemeteries, distant planets, old west villages. This is the first time, other than possibly the Gideon meat plant, where it really looks like it belongs. Is there some greater meaning to this? Are we going to wind up fixing a generator to power a familiar breaker box in the game and gradually realize that it's this experience that the entity is forcing people to relive over and over again in one form or another? We know hooking people is integral to Farrink's story, as it's depicted here at the bottom of the webpage. That's clearly a woman in a dress suspended from a hook in the woods, while what looks like another woman looks on. So will this be the first Dead by Daylight story? The language used, cosmic mysteries, scars in the fabric of reality, all refer to the well-established lore of the entity and Dead by Daylight as a whole. But putting Spawn in there really does make it seem like Frank is starting something with this. And this may wind up being an origin story of this aspect of the entity. It doesn't really tie in. But let's be on the lookout for some meaning to the fact that the title is presented as Rusted Metal Covered in Flaking White Paint, which has been cut into pieces with a blowtorch. Now let's look at the hidden object game that I played in another video. It's extremely close to the workbench we saw in the video, with a huge number of recognizable items, from the gas cans to the vise, right down to the stool tucked away under the bench. Notable in their absence, though, are the two strange ancient axes, which I spent so much time talking about in my analysis video. There's no sign of them whatsoever. I wonder if that means they're particularly meaningful and will turn up as weapons in the game. Here's the images that pop up when you find nine items in the Hidden Object game. The Cedar Hills Tribune. First off is the super inappropriate tagline, News to Die For. Maybe leave that off the paper when you're talking about a brutal murder, huh? Then we've got the date, September 17th, 1962, which confirms what we suspected about the cop car. The original murders took place in the early 60s. Will the prologue be set there? I mean, probably, right? Why else would they go to the trouble of building a model of the steel mill in its prime? Just for a series of cutscenes and photographs? 
Seems like that would be a waste. As for the article, it details the murder of George Calhern and Joyce Barton by parties unknown. Probably Frank Stone, though, because why else would he keep this as a souvenir? Interestingly, it seems like he was taking care to cover up his crimes at this point. After killing the couple, Frank placed them in their car, set it on fire, and then pushed it off the road, presumably down some kind of a ravine. A couple of things about the article. First, the line, car was parked when it left the road, is just awkward as hell. Just say that it was pushed or rolled off the road. Because it obviously wasn't parked. If it had been, how did it go off the road? It would have had to have at least been in neutral, or more likely in drive, for Frank to be able to move it. Next up, it's important to remember that newspapers are always justified to the left and right. The letters are always flush to either side of each paragraph, with the extra spaces being put equally between the words. It's also weird that the headline refers to someone as Calhern's son. I mean, maybe in Cedar Hills, owning a drugstore is the most prestigious role in the community, but it seems like an odd way to describe someone. I mean, it's probably there so that the casual player who doesn't bother downloading the full resolution version of the image will have a better chance of remembering the name. But that's no reason not to call out awkward scripting, is it? Also, it's strange that the game's comment on the newspaper is that the victims were both so young, since the article states that William was 28 when he died. Now, Joyce's age is not given. 28 doesn't seem notably young now, and in 1962, that would be a crazy thing to say. For context, Blanche Dubois was a 30-year-old woman in a streetcar named Desire. Names to keep a lookout for. Obviously, the Calhern family is going to be prominent. The screenshot they released to the main street is a picture of Calhern's pharmacy, so don't be shocked if one of the main characters is a member of that family, with the death of William factoring prominently into their motivation for checking out the decrepit steel plant. Also worth noting are the Bartons, Joyce's family, and Sheriff Kusick, who is investigating the crime. Is that his car at the steel mill? Is he who we'll be playing as in the prologue? We should also keep an eye on Dorothy Clay, who was supposedly murdered by her nephew, Elvin, two months earlier. Was this actually another one of Frank's victims, and the cops simply framed someone to keep the town quiet? Something to remember as we start getting more clues. Next is the Book of Weapons sketches. We can assume that the names, D. Parker and E. Kessler, are some of Frank's victims, and these are the weapons that he planned to use on them. It's notable that he dismissed the idea of using a thrown hook on a chain as a weapon because he wants to get in close for his kills. Here's the hammer he ended up building based on the sketch. Given the blood, I'm guessing he did wind up using it on someone. The second page reveals that the hammer likely killed his victim too quickly, and he wants the next victim to suffer, so he's moved on to using modded scissors or a sharpened file to slice people up, one small cut at a time. We get a look at the file, which has visibly been sharpened, but has no bloodstains on it. Also, it seems to have lost most of the wrapping that we see Frank putting on it in the trailer. The costume sketch is an interesting piece due to the language used. As the game points out, purging the world sounds like a mission. So the question we have to ask is, what specifically was he trying to purge, and how was he determining who represented the thing that needs purging? The creature reference also brings Frankenstein to mind, as that was one of the memorable ways the Doctor referred to his creation. Forged, of course, refers to being crafted in a fire, which reinforces the steel mill connection. Even though, of course, things are generally cast in steel mills, not forged. The mask looks super creepy in close-up, but we've gotten way better looks at it elsewhere. I maintain that it doesn't really look bloodstained enough for it to be worth mentioning in the description, but then again... I'm probably being distracted by the sheer volume of blood on Frank's face. The photo of the cedar steel mill has a few new details. The smokestack with the business name on it is a nice touch. As is the motto of the work safely sign. It seems to say, we can if we will, we will if we plan. Given the amount of prep work that seems to have gone into Frank Stone's murder spree, he seems to have taken this motto to heart. Also, is that Frank's pickup truck? I guess it could be anyone's. Finally, we've got the meat hook, which the person looking at in the clue hopes isn't blood, but the background lets us know much better. So that's the website. Now let's look at the exclusive interview that IGN freelancer Ashley Barden did with behaviors Dave Richard and Matthew Cote, as well as supermassive Steve Goss. It's a very coy interview, full of promises that we're going to be completely surprised by what we encounter, as well as assuring us that this will work for both fans of Dead by Daylight and Supermassive Games. The stated impetus for the game? 
that there's a fan base for the franchise that doesn't actually play Dead by Daylight. I have no doubt that that's accurate. In addition to actual players, it's an incredibly popular game for people to watch. And if you can tap into that audience with a single player experience, there's a crazy amount of money to be made. Presumably, this is also why they're working on a movie. We're also assured that we don't need to know anything about the Dead by Daylight lore to understand the game, which is a plus to those of us still learning. They also mentioned that telling an original story set in the world was their best option, as it wouldn't step on any existing continuity or audience expectations. The most interesting part of the interview is when they start getting into the differences between this and other supermassive games. Goss specifically says that the game's story will be structurally and tonally different from what we'd expect from Until Dawn or The Quarry. As for tonal differences, we can't make any clear inferences about what that might mean just yet, since we don't have any real information about Frank Stone's plot. Structurally, though, this seems to suggest that the story might be more expansive than we're used to. The reason you'd put Until Dawn and the Quarry next to one another from a structural standpoint is that both games start with a prologue set some time before the game's main action, which establish the game's threat, and then we get the main action of the game, which takes place over a single night. Given that we've already seen screenshots set in both the 60s and the late 70s to mid 80s, we're likely to see the time separation structure, perhaps even the teaser in the past we're used to. So that leaves the time over which the game takes place as the only structural change they could be talking about. Will this be a larger adventure set over days or even weeks, rather than the single night affair we're used to? That would be a huge departure, and I'm intrigued to see what they do with it. The other big takeaway is that they're specifically asked if this is an origin story, and the answer to that is, no, it isn't. Why am I not discouraged by that answer? Because, obviously, it could easily be a lie. After all, if the game's big surprise was that this was the origin of the entity's trials, would you reveal that in an IGN interview when the game was first revealed? Of course not. You'd lie about it, and you'd be right to do so. So I'm not calling that theory busted just yet. It's a little odd that the big question, will Frank Stone be a playable character that launches on Dead by Daylight when the game comes out, doesn't get asked. That seems like an oversight. Maybe that's something they agreed not to talk about beforehand? Finally, let's talk about the new art that shows up in the IGN interview. Here's a look at the main street from a new angle. No big new information here, other than the main street runs east-west. I should have mentioned it last time, but the afterpiece tonic that the Calhern Pharmacy sells is the drug that the clown uses to incapacitate people in Dead by Daylight. Does this create a connection to the Calhern family and the murderous clown? Maybe? But you know, it could just be there as a joke. Then we get a look at Frank's workbench. In addition to the neat articulated lamp, there's also a mouse trap on the floor, baited with cheese. As if we didn't have enough reasons to hate the guy already. Here's a better picture of the Safe Work logo in the still active 60s steel mill. In addition to the trucks, we can see a locomotive engine parked at the back of the frame, which goes a long way towards explaining the presence of that suspended train car in the store page images. So that's the website and interviews. Plenty of new interesting stuff for us to noodle over. Be sure to let me know if there's any other Dead by Daylight references I'm missing. I had to Google Afterpiece Tonic. For now, though, I've been the Hidden Object Guru. Thanks for watching. If you had a good time and you'd like to see more, there's buttons coming up to help you with that. Questions, suggestions, related whatnots, go in the comment section below the video. We'll see you back here for more Frank Stone content as information reveals itself. But until then, I'll say that's right. Au revoir.